morning, or good afternoon. Welcome to Chinook. This will be a safety briefing at, on the Bell 47, in this case, Bell 47 G2, KNC. Uh, I give my safety briefings the same way I give my customer briefings when I'm working. Really, I like to start back from the machine outside of the rotor disc. And I want to show you something really specific. A great safety briefing, if you have to give one to your customer, talks about what can hurt people, what, what's there to help people, and ultimately how they're likely to use the things they're going to use, like the doors and seatbelts. So we're going to start with what can hurt you at first. Uh, I'm going to back off here, I'm going to grab the rotor and I'm going to pull it down just to show you how low the tips can possibly go. So we're outside of the rotor disc at this point, but anytime you're coming and going, um, you got to be aware that these rotor tips are moving Bell 47, 400 miles an hour when you're at flight idle. And uh, Jet Ranger, R44, 480 miles an hour. And with the ability to flap, um, a very big hazard. So, stand by. And if you want to move towards the blade, we'll show you. I mean, this is easily below my head height. And when you start factoring slope into the scenario, your head can get closer and closer to the blade tip. So, big hazard. Now, with all of our students, you'll be in the machine, you'll be starting it more. It's more likely the instructor's gonna be coming and going when the blades are turning. However, when you shut the machine down, blades lose their inertia, they start to flap, and uh, there's a very real possibility when you're waiting for the blades to stop after you shut down the machine, this blade can come this low. So, big hazard, please keep that in mind. So in addition to being mindful of the blades and uh, the flapping potential and just how low the blade tips can come, all the instructors here at Chinook are going to wait for your approval to approach the helicopter. They're going to stay outside the rotor disc and uh, they're going to wait for you to give them the nod. Now remember as helicopter pilots we have our hands busy, hands on the cycle, on the collective, so really you need to get used to yes you can approach or no you can't. I'm not a big fan of seeing the thumbs up um, because that's somebody taking their hands off of one of the controls to give me approval to come. So, typically, the students in the aircraft, they don't have to worry about approaching the helicopter when it's running. But it is still really important to keep your head down, control your belongings. If you're wearing a hat, if you've got a loose, loose clothing, uh, a light jacket, everything needs to be controlled around the helicopter. So, um, when you are approaching and the blades are spinning, Head down, give that healthy bit of respect to the blade tips. Once you get to the aircraft, with the pilot's approval, um, and you're, you're within touching distance of the aircraft, it's very safe, you know, the blades are up over your head. But please, in the, the low points of the blades, the tips of the blades, give them a healthy bit of respect. Tail rotor, in the distance, also a very big hazard. Now this one's a body height. That is a buzz saw. So there's no walking behind the aircraft when the blades are, are spinning when the engine's on. Um, in fact, for a customer safety briefing, don't let them go under the tail boom. Um, don't let them go back towards the tail motor. So those are two very obvious hazards. But the Bell 47, since there's no cowlings, you do have other hazards we need to be aware of. If you want to follow me. Here we have an exposed tail rotor drive shaft. And it doesn't look like much, but it has the inertia of several hundred pounds between the blades, the head, and uh, the masts that are the inertia, this is, it doesn't look like much, but if you were to get your scarf wrapped up in it or your fingers, you don't want to get comfortable leaning on the tail boom back here. This is a very real hazard, this drive shaft. In addition to that, we have an exhaust pipe um, coming off the engine, scalding hot. It will melt your clothes, it will burn your hands. So, this, unfortunately for customers, if you were working this Bell 47 in the field, they would have to come out here and put their baggage in the baggage compartment. It's pretty funny because if you bend down, you're just going to get exhaust blowing right in your face. But those are the main hazards on this Bell 47. Blades, blade tips, tail rotor, um, exhaust, hot parts of the engine, and the tail rotor drive shaft. So that's what, you, that's what can hurt you, potentially. So let's talk about what can help you, what legally needs to be on board the aircraft um, for survival and, and safety. So, if you want to look in the front of the aircraft, several of the things are in the cockpit. One of them is our first aid kit. Yellow kit with the cross on it, and there is a sticker on top telling you exactly what's in there. And the key with the first aid kit is if, if we need to use it, we will. But you need to let the PIC know that you've taken something out of there. It's got a little lock wire on it, uh, and if that's broken, we need to keep this stocked up. So, um, first aid kit. We also have a fire extinguisher. 
fire extinguishers on all these aircraft are always within reach of the, of the pilot. Here, left side is the PIC side for Bell 47. So you have a fire extinguisher, um, which A, we need to look at and make sure it's charged up. And yearly, annually, it needs to be uh, certified. But uh, that is locked down, but within reach of the pilot. Again, I tell everybody, the only reason is that legally it needs to be on board the aircraft. The only reason it's on board is to extinguish a fire when we're on the ground. You would never shoot that off while we're flying. It contains halon. We don't breathe halon. We can't see if you blast it off. In addition to a potential smoke in the cockpit, which are very rare, um, we could have two other emergencies that we introduce just because we didn't wait till we got to the ground. So um, it is available to us, but please don't touch that while we're flying. That brings us to our emergency locator transmitter. Every aircraft has one. And we have not only a, an ELT, but we also have a button available to us inside, a remote button. So um, I'll ask you to come inside the door, have a look at the button on the far side there, the ELT button. Notice that it's in the armed position. So if there was a shock, a G-force hard enough, it would automatically go off, but we can select it on as well. And then the satellites can pick up our position. In the old days, the search radius was kilometers, and now with the 406 megahertz uh, ELTs, very, it's hundreds of meters. So if we if say we couldn't get the machine started, we shut down, we couldn't get it going again, press the ELT, and everybody's going to come help us. So that is available to us, in addition to our radios, um, the fact that we're on a flight itinerary, yada yada. There's, uh, and we have our own fleet of aircraft, so if, if a machine gets stranded somewhere, we'll come get you. But that ELT is available to us, so that's the button. That is not the ELT. ELT is right here. Next to the sticker that says ELT located here. We'll open up the cargo. And you can see the ELT in the background. Mounted yeah, basically at a 45 degree angle. Because that's the most likely impact angle with an aircraft like a helicopter would be going forwards and down uh, upon impact. There you go, there's our ELT. It is an automatic fix, not intended to be taken out of the aircraft. And the antenna, the ELT, it's right here. Now in addition to those three things, depending on where we're going, we may also take a survival kit with us. In, at Chinook, the survival kits are not dedicated to the machines, they are separate. Um, and with this particular machine, only 15 pounds is allowed to be put in the baggage compartment, so we need to pick a survival kit that's 15 pounds or less in order to put it back there. So that is the survival equipment and safety equipment meant to help us. In this case, now I'll show you how to use all the things you're likely to use. Primarily, the doors. Pretty simple. It's a 180 degree turn, so there's latched, there's unlatched, and when you're inside, you want to make sure not to bump it because the door occasionally could fly open if people are, uh, are nudging the handle. When we open the door, you'll also see there's an emergency release. Now if it gets hot outside, we can take the do doors off on purpose. But if we needed to, I won't take it completely off, but I'll show you. Lift it, turn it, and the door will literally fall right off. So it is an emergency exit in addition to it being our, our normal exit or can be, both doors are the same. This left side, this is where the student will be sitting. This is in the Bell 47, it's the PIC side. Of course, we have our collective, um, our throttle, our cyclic, our anti-torque pedals. The seat belts, we have six currently, six Bell 47s, and the seat belts can vary a little bit. In this case, um, three of the machines have seat belts like this, they're four point, okay. That's the safety briefing for the Bell 47 G2 here at Chinook Helicopters. Um, in case you haven't got enough about safety, we also have a safety briefing card, just like an airliner would, in between the two seats. And the safety briefing card is a summary of what I've just told you, plus a couple more things. Of course, no smoking, no cell phones, very common in aviation. Uh, it's got crash positions, how to use the fire extinguisher, and of course your emergency exits come and go out of the aircraft, plus your approaches and how people should approach your aircraft as well with um, caveats for walking uphill away from a helicopter with the blades spinning. So uh, a great way to finish off any safety brief, point people towards your emergency uh, procedures and your safety information uh, card in your Bell 47. 
Thanks for your time. Have a great flight.